We are joined this week by a panel to discuss how climate change is impacting the Adirondacks. Dr. Eric Leibensberger, who we just heard from a few moments ago, is a climate scientist at the Center for Earth and Environmental Science at SUNY Plattsburgh. Dr. Leanne Sporn is a biologist at Paul Smith's College. Brendan Kurian is the director of the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. And Willie Janeway is the executive director of the Adirondack Council, the largest conservation group covering the Adirondacks. Welcome to you all. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Eric, Thank you. let's start with you and the warming that we're seeing in the Adirondacks. You have weather data dating back more than a century now to the early 1900s that showed this increase of nearly two degrees Celsius or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Much of that changed just within the past few decades? Yeah, we, what we've uh, found by looking at some of the old records and looking and, and coupling it with the more modern records that we have is that the climate has really been accelerating in, um, in, its, in its change. Uh, the warming has most, most uh, rapidly occurred since the 1980s, 1990s, and, and to the present day. Um, not to say that we didn't have warming early on, but the, but the warming has definitely accelerated. Um, and these records um, you know, are, are what we find in the Adirondacks. We find it in the North Country of New York. We find it um, all across North America, all across the Northern Hemisphere, all across the globe. And so what we're seeing in the Adirondacks here is just a microcosm of what's happening on a global scale. And mostly during the winter months? Is, it, is that when it's happening? That's correct. So the largest warming that we've been seeing are, are in the winter and, and fall months. Um, kind of the fall, uh, summer extending a little bit more into the fall and uh, the winter months uh, being a little um, mild uh, in general than they have in the past. That doesn't mean that we haven't had some cold winters in the last few years, um, but on average, what we expect, if we look at the climate record, which is uh, looking at the long term uh, and, uh, and uh, what uh, ecosystems and people can expect, uh, we've noticed warming, especially in the winter season. And why the winter? Why do you believe that's happening? So the winter seasons actually um, are uh, what we would expect uh, of a, a climate that's being changed by greenhouse gases. In the winter, we have longer uh, time periods where we have uh, uh, the sun down, and so uh, a, lot of, a lot of clear skies. Um, and so those periods are when the greenhouse effect is really the most potent. Mm -hmm. And in the wintertime, uh, well, we've been noticing that. The coldest days in the winter have been not quite as cold as they have been in the past. Um, and uh, it's been a, an increase where the winters are, are kind of rising above um, any other season. So it's not that we're seeing hotter days during the summer, that our hotter days are getting hotter. It's that our colder days, our coldest days, are not quite as cold as they used to be. Yeah, the, so the, the warm days are, are definitely um, getting a little bit more, but it's really the, 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 uh, the cold days. You're right, the minimum temperatures, the, the lowest uh, lows are not quite as low as they used to be. And you mentioned in the story we saw just a few moments ago, if business stays as usual, things don't change, you believe we're going to see this increase rapidly, that within the next 20, 30 years, we could see another two degrees Celsius or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, uh, the trajectory that we're going right now uh, on a global scale um, is what scientists typically study as the worst case option, uh, business as usual. And the business as usual has us right now, um, as you mentioned, warming about two degrees um, in the coming, um, in the coming uh, decades, uh, which is rapid. Uh, it's, a, it's a fast change. And it's one of the reasons why we're concerned about climate change is because the climate is what we expect, it's what's expected. And if we're changing what's expected, um, you know, nature does not know exactly what to do. Lake Champlain doesn't freeze over as much as it used to. It did freeze over this winter, Correct. but are we now seeing a pattern where that freeze is coming later in the season and the ice maybe isn't as, isn't as thick as it used to be? Yeah, so uh, uh, our observations show us that Lake Champlain uh, is not freezing over nearly as much as it, as it once did. Um, you know, think earlier in the early part of the 20th century, it would regularly freeze over almost every year, and it was almost uh, a special event when it didn't freeze over. And now, uh, what we're seeing is that it freezes over once every three years to three or four years, um, uh, which is a much a lower frequency than we saw in the past. And on top of that, the ice is thinner, um, we, we believe. Um, records of ice thickness are not as great as, as we would like them to be, but we believe the ice is thinner. And uh, the ice season is definitely uh, getting shorter. If you think of our last season here in 2019, the lake did freeze over, um, but it was only at the very end of the season. It was only for, um, you know, actually a, f a few weeks, or a week or two, um, that it was actually deemed frozen over before uh, melting again. Willie, with the shorter, warmer winters, as we saw in Jack's piece, this is forcing Whiteface and other ski resorts to adapt to these changes. The state of New York operates Whiteface and Warm Mountains. Did they, or any of the folks that operate the mountains, did they see this coming and are they doing a good job at adapting to the changing winters? 
um, the state clearly knows that the threat of climate change, the leaders of New York State are no longer debating whether or not it's happening. They're debating instead what we need to actually do. So they are taking aggressive action. They're still arguing over exactly which plans to implement. Whether or not that's going to be enough to save the winter recreational economy in the Adirondacks, it's really too early to know. Um, but the first part of addressing the problem is acknowledging it, stopping the debate about it, and moving to the debate about solutions. And as and we saw in Jack's piece, they're investing in snowmaking equipment, certainly at Whiteface. They're yeah. saying the majority, they believe, of the snow that they have there will be man-made snow. And that will buy time, but whether or not that by itself is enough, most folks would suggest no. So the state is doing more than investing in those facilities in snowmaking. It's also looking more comprehensively as how New York teaming up with other states can still implement the Paris Peace Accord, the Paris Accord, how New York State can still lead on doing the other things, reducing emissions, improving their resiliency. Um, so the, the state has a good vision and, and its leaders in the legislature and in the governor's office very much understand the issue, whether or not we'll get everything aligned and the resources to act fast enough. The state tends to, like any state, act incrementally, and this is a problem where incremental solutions are not going to do it. You know, climate change is going to really be devastating to the Adirondack region as we know it in a lot of ways. Some parts will survive, but a lot of what we value here will be severely impacted. So that the state has flagged the problem and it's starting to move, but a lot more needs to still happen. A lot of ski r resorts may not be able to afford the equipment that they need yeah. to the degree to make the amount of snow that they'll need. Certainly there are also cross-country ski trails, there's snowmobiling, there's snowshoeing. Some cross-country ski centers around the Northeast, including Mount Van Hovenberg, are investing in equipment to make snow to cover the trails. But for the others, what sort of impact could we see overall on regions like the Lake Placid, the Tri Lakes, the Adirondacks? We've been seeing some of the smaller places think Big Tupper not be able to stay open without snowmaking. And we've been seeing Mount Van Hovenberg start to incorporate snowmaking. That buys some additional time. Hopefully it gives us a window of opportunity to take the other actions that are needed to make sure the problem doesn't get even worse. The economic impact is huge. It is. Tourism is the key driver for the economy, for the jobs. I mean, you know, thankfully we have really resilient and intelligent people in the North Country, but it's going to take a lot more on, on multiple fronts. There's no one thing that will solve it. We are seeing visitors at other times of the year. Yes. Obviously, hikers are coming in droves. Uh, yes. That's an we'll issue within now. itself. Yes. So successful, we have too many. But, but it's a great thing. Though. And we're seeing other seasons. We're bringing visitors in at other times of the year. But for a long time, really, winter sports have driven the economy in the, in the Adirondacks. The economy is dependent on a year-round destination that the Adirondacks do provide. But what we provide is going to need to shift and change as climate change changes what we have. Leanne, Brendan, we're coming to you next. Let's take a quick break, though. When we come back, we're going to discuss the impact climate change is having on invasive species, on the tick population, on our forests and wildlife, as well as what the state and communities are doing to address climate change. The climate is changing, and we need places where nature is left alone, where we can watch natural processes work themselves out. The Adirondacks are one of the largest and most intact temperate mixed deciduous forests left on the globe. And because of that global significance, our obligation to do conservation work here is really important. And welcome back to Mountain Lake Journal. If you're tuning in looking for New York Now, it will be on at a special time this week, Sunday morning at 5. This week, we are expanding Mountain Lake Journal to a full hour to discuss the effects of climate change on the Adirondacks. We will get to questions and comments from our studio audience in just a few minutes. But first, let's welcome Leanne Sporn, who is a biology professor at Paul Smith College. Dr. Sporn, you have spent the past several years tracking ticks in the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. How significant of an increase have we seen in recent years? Well, I began doing this about five years ago, and at that time, the common lore was there are no ticks in the Adirondacks, uh, the type that cause disease, that carry disease that, that affect humans, maybe along the shores of Lake Champlain, but really in the interior of the park in the North Country, that was the lore, and uh, the data prior to us getting involved really showed that the densities, if they're at all, were incredibly low. But what I've seen over the past five years is just an incredibly astounding increase both in the numbers of ticks and the distribution. So what we're experiencing is a range expansion. It's coming northward and a bit westward, but north northward up from the lower Hudson Valley. And coming into the Adirondacks, coming, they absolutely. were not here in the Adirondacks before. That's correct. And not only are they coming further north, but they're 
climbing into higher, higher elevations? Up into higher elevations. And are you seeing a variety of species of ticks, different variations? Well, there are, I think, 27 tick species in New York State. Most of them we're not really concerned about, and most of them we're not monitoring. We're really focusing on the black-legged tick or deer tick that carries human pathogens. And that's the, and that's the predominant tick in, in this area of the, of the state, yes. And that is the biggest worry. Yes. There is some concern about what impact ticks are having on wildlife, on mm -hmm. moose and others, because if they get so many ticks on them, it can certainly affect their health. Mm -hmm. But the primary concern, and certainly for you, is, is human health. That's correct. Because of Lyme disease. Because of Lyme disease. And Lyme disease and uh, several others. Uh, recently, we've detected babesiosis in the park. It's a malaria-like parasite. Who would ever have guessed that we, you could contract basically malaria in, in the mm -hmm. North Country? We've seen cases of that here in Clinton County. Uh, anaplasmosis, and last year, uh, we did a, a large study of deer population. We used them as sentinels and discovered the very deadly Powassan virus is present in the North Country as well. So we actually test for five different human pathogens in the, in the deer ticks. But primarily Lyme disease? Prim uh, what we see is that the incidence of Lyme disease is the highest in this. That, that's the most common tick-borne disease by far in the North Country. But the numbers of, ca of human cases and the percentage of ticks that are infected with the, the other diseases that I mentioned is increasing as well. And are people just waking up to the fact that Lyme disease is here and that potentially they yeah. can get it? And, and are, is the medical community just becoming aware that Lyme disease yeah. is, is here? Uh, I think both. Like I said, it's sort of the common lore. It takes a long time to change that. Uh, people come to the park to visit, often from areas where ticks and tick-borne diseases are endemic because they think there are no ticks here. Uh, and the population might be less and more patchy than where they might be from in other areas of the state. So that puts people at particular risk if we don't get the word out that, yes, there is this risk here. And the number of cases in humans is steadily rising almost exponentially here in the park. And uh, the incidence rate is really some of the highest in the state right now in, in this area, uh, which is very surprising because our tick densities are still quite low. The deer tick that carries it, the overwhelming majority of them carry Lyme disease, yes. or, or is there no way of knowing what percentage of deer ticks carry it? No, we do. We, we collect enough ticks from sites throughout the whole North Country every year that we know that um, about half of adult ticks are infected with Lyme disease here. About 10 percent are uh, infected with babesiosis, the malaria-like parasite, and about 10 percent with anaplasmosis. And interestingly, you mentioned the medical community. Uh, diagnosing these is very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a clinical diagnosis. It's one that can't be identified early with a blood test. It requires the healthcare provider to know what they're looking for. So the context is important, and that's the most important piece of information that they need to protect the health of visitors and residents is if these diseases are present. Is there a local risk of acquiring these diseases? And that's the information that we try to provide, and indeed there is. And the information that you provide with the health department in New York State mm -hmm. has been uh, critical for a number of years now. Uh, this year, though, for the first time in the legislature, your funding has dried up and it does not appear that the legislature is going to give you the funding you need to continue on. That is correct. Uh, there was a, a task force that was put together by the New York State Senate um, that was uh, uh, disbanded, I guess, for a while when the, the Senate switched uh, parties. Um, we did lobby hard to get the funding restored to that task force, but it was cut at the last minute. So at this current time, there is no Senate funding for any of this work. I might also point out that um, in these, these counties here in the Adirondacks, because of our low year-round population, we really don't have fully staffed local county health departments. In fact, Franklin, Essex, and Hamilton counties uh, don't have any environmental component to the, to the health department. So we're really serving as an extension to what the state can do uh, because they just don't have the capacity to monitor. So as climate change continues, there's going to be more and more of a need to, uh, to have this information. We have a low year round population, but we have millions and millions of visitors to the park every year. And it's our responsibility to protect their health as well as our residents. You mentioned the adult ticks pass it on. Can mm -hmm. the nymphs, can the small ticks also pass along yes. Lyme disease? Yes, and we're just heading into nymph season now. Um, they're small and they're hard to detect, but the majority, the vast majority of human cases come from a uh, bite of a nymph. For Maybe because the biology, they might be better at transmitting Lyme, or people might not notice that they are being bitten by a, a nymphal tick They're the size of poppy seeds. And is that a case then that people may not know they've been bitten? Because often mm -hmm. we hear That's about right. look for the target, uh, that, uh, that but not everyone gets telltale that. sign yes. that, uh, right. that you've been bitten by a tick. But if it's a nymph, you may not actually see that. You might not. And most of the tick-borne diseases look the same clinically, and they look like other diseases. It's, they're often fairly nondescript symptoms. 
So knowing what the local risk is is incredibly important. And seeing the increase that you've seen over the past few years, is there any doubt in your mind what's driving the tick population in Oregon? That's a very good point. Um, a lot of people believe it's increases in deer population. It's really not driving that range expansion. So what's driving the, the ticks into new territories, which we're at the heart of, we're in the leading edge of that range expansion, is definitely climate change. So what Eric mentioned about the, the warmer winter weather, that's critical. The ticks have to overwinter. They have a two-year life cycle. So they're able to do that. They're able to have more, uh, they like moisture. They dry out readily. Uh, so the warmer, wetter um, climate is definitely causing causing the expansion. And in the past, it was just too cold for them to get this far north. Likely, they didn't have enough suitable time to see coasts. And, and while the ticks are certainly a major threat, there are at least two other forest pests that are spreading closer to the Adirondack Park. One is already here, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, which was found in a small cluster of trees in Lake George in 2017. If it spreads and gets a foothold, it could threaten millions of hemlock trees in the park. So far, scientists have been able to contain it using pesticide to control it. The other worry is a beetle called the Emerald Ash Borer, which has crossed the St. Lawrence River from Canada and has been found in St. Lawrence and Franklin counties just north of the park. That pest tunnels its way into ash trees. It's killed tens of thousands of ash trees in Montreal and in both Quebec and Ontario. Uh, Brendan, uh, as director of the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, you work to prevent these and other invasive species from getting into the Adirondack Park. So far, so good with the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid is the hope that you've been able to contain it to just those few trees and so far it hasn't spread any further into the park? That's the hope. Um, you know, it is a near-term or short-term solution to be able to treat individual trees with pesticides to address this insect. Uh, we do know that the winters are getting warmer and similar to the tick situation that hemlock weed adelgia is being able to expand its range into areas where it once was unable to. So it's really a matter of time as far as when we find it in other locations in the park. And that's why it's so important to develop long-term solutions for this insect. Um, Cornell University is currently developing a biocontrol agent, um, and we're hopeful that that can be released in large quantities over the landscape. Um, but that's really going to take decades to develop and, and have an abundance to release. So they're looking at a, a beetle, Laracobius nigrinus, as well as a silver fly. And the hope is that these can be released. They will control hemlock woolly adelgid and reduce populations without affecting anything else. Um, the challenge is, is rearing enough beetles to address something that could potentially wipe out all hemlocks across the north e northeast. Um, it's, it spreads pathog or parthenogenically, so it only takes one insect to create a population um, of thousands or millions of individuals. Mm -hmm. So we need to create enough biocontrol agents to suppress those um, infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid so that they don't impact our hemlock trees. And the emerald ash borer is a concern. It hasn't technically made it into the Adirondack Park, but it's certainly knocking at the door in Franklin and St. Lawrence counties. It is, and really that one was a matter of time. It's not so much limited by climate, um, you know, although you know very cold winters can reduce populations. Um, it's really primarily spread in, in firewood, in wood packing material, and it's a good flyer. So it can fly long distances and spread into new areas very quickly. So in the case of the Emerald Ash Borer, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, and the Asian Clam, which has now spread to certain parts of Lake George and aquatic invasive species, the thought is that the winters not being quite as cold may give them more of a chance to survive. Exactly. Um, we, we didn't think that Hemlock Woolly Adelgid or Asian Clam would be able to survive in the Adirondacks, and yet here they are. So um, they are harbingers of what is to come. We do expect other, other species that are farther south right now to move northward, species like kudzu um, or other, other ones that we've never had to deal with before. So climate change is making things much more complicated in the invasive species realm. And I was gonna ask you about plants. Are there particular plants you're watching? Is hydrilla something that is at all affected by climate change and warming temperatures or is that more likely just the, the, the danger that that's going to arrive on a boat somewhere, as we saw in Saranac Lake a couple of years ago, nearly getting into Upper Saranac Lake. Is that a, a plant that's not necessarily uh, affected by changing temperatures? Well, we know it's doing very well in Florida right now, um, so climate change will certainly help it. Um, it's probably not the main driver of expansion of that species. Uh, I think it could probably do pretty well in, in Adirondack Lakes right now, but I, I think it would do better. And Eric, uh, speaking of aquatic invasive species, you also monitor water temperatures in Lake Champlain during the summer months and compare them to records over the past 25 years or so. What are you finding uh, with those water temperatures? Are you also seeing an increase in, in the temperature of Lake Champlain? Yeah, we've been studying Lake Champlain and using the records that have been collected 
uh, as part of the long-term monitoring program that is, uh, has been funded by uh, the US EPA and the Vermont and New York DECs. And uh, all we've been finding is that the lake is warming. Um, it's not too surprising that it's warming because the, the air is warming. Uh, but what is a little bit surprising to us is how quickly uh, the water is warming. It's warming at, at a rate that almost matches uh, the, the air temperature. So uh, over the last 25 years or so, we, uh, uh, we've 25 years or so, we've seen a uh, warming of about a degree and a half or so uh, of, of warming in the, in the summer season, um, uh, which, is, which is alarming. And we, we project into the future looking, uh, looking ahead. Uh, that you know, by the end of the century, we could see another degree and a half or two degrees of warming in the water, um, which will have uh, important consequences for the ecosystems and what species will, will thrive and which ones might um, kind of be pushed out. But could we see it? We've always heard that with warming temperatures, we may see more algae, blue-green algae, and of course, blue-green algae can be uh, toxic at times, so that's probably one concern. What are some of the other concerns that we could see? Uh, well, there's concerns um, over um, kind of uh, invasive species moving in and finding a habitat that might be uh, more favorable to them and kind of allowing them to, to thrive and, and uh, kind of prey on local species and push them out. Um, and I think also another important thing about uh, climate change is, you know, we do expect there to be uh, time periods where, especially in the summer, uh, where there are, are some hot periods and there are some calm periods and those hot sunny periods are right for, uh, for algae blooms as you, as, you, as you mentioned. And so as these temperatures warm, it makes things conducive for water quality to be degraded. And it kind of uh, puts what we, what we tend to call a climate change penalty um, on our ability to improve water quality um, and air quality as well. Uh, our efforts to improve our water quality and air quality are there. Uh, we've reduced emissions, we're doing all of these things to reduce phosphorus in the lake and to reduce uh, air pollutants, uh, but climate change can, can uh, jeopardize the efficacy of some of those uh, measures. With the warmer temperatures in the lake, we hear so much about the shipwrecks, the historic shipwrecks, way down in the cold, cold waters. Does it get to a point where they could be impacted by these changing temperatures, or is this so far up closer to the surface that it really wouldn't have an effect? The largest amount of warming that we've seen and what we'd expect to see is near the surface. Uh, and actually what might happen in, this, in the uh, uh, summer seasons is more of a decoupling or kind of a uh, segmentation of the lake where the top layer and the bottom layer uh, don't interact with each other very much, which also is important for water quality. Uh, but that also means that some of the uh, shipwrecks that are down there in the bottom uh, will be less perturbed by things that happen at the surface. And so they actually might um, see a little bit of a benefit and, and be uh, protected. And Leanne, I don't know, being a, a biologist, if this may be more for you, but we've heard from folks that they've seen possums here uh, in the Adirondacks and that that's new that they haven't seen possums this far north in New York. So are we seeing other species that uh, we're seeing migrate north as well? Yeah, I think we were chatting about this uh, prior and Brendan I think noted that the possum is susceptible to frostbite. So it wasn't a suitable habitat for it here, but now now is. Mm -hmm. As species are pushed out you know, northward, we're getting other species from the south moving in. And those could be bad species like invasive species or, or ticks that are, are causing human health impacts, but they could also be beneficial species. Um, species like red oak or, or possums may do much better mm -hmm. in the Adirondacks longer term. And we talk about the forest, and you mentioned the, the trees. Uh, we heard a little bit before in our piece about the boreal forest in the Adirondacks. Uh, biologists we talked with at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies say they're already seeing a shrinking of these forests in the Catskills. Will other trees like hardwoods, as you mentioned, move further north into the higher elevations? Are we going to see a changing of the forest? Definitely. So um, it is likely that we could lose the boreal forest, but we're not going to lose the forest. There's always going to be trees. Forests are very resilient. So as long as there are species to recolonize, they will. Um, so I would anticipate our, our tree species transitioning from, you know, things like sugar maple, red maple, to, you know, red oak, um, white oak. So um, the forest will be here, it'll just look different. and It'll provide different benefits. And so people will pick up on one of the things you said though, sugar maples. So could we see a dramatic change in the maple industry as we know it here in the northern New York and the Adirondacks? Long term, yes. Um, if, if, you know, as business as usual continues, um, we could be, be having our forest transition to things very similar to Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, perhaps. So um, in those states, there is no sugar maple industry right now. Are there any upsides to warming temperatures? Will it extend the growing season here in the Adirondacks and could that be good for farmers and gardeners? Or 
Is it likely that with the changing weather patterns that we're seeing, that farmers with that changing climate are going to see the challenges of a lot more severe weather and heavy rainstorms that they're going to have to deal with as well? Yes, there are upsides, and you can talk to different experts in different areas, and they'll identify some, and they're usually quick to say, but there's a lot more downsides. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the list of the downsides, the, the, the weight is, is heavily on that side. I think it's the, rap the rapidity of change that is so worrisome. Change is good. Ch change is always happening. But when, it, when you were disrupting habitat and disrupting ecosystems and change is happening so quickly, unexpected things happen. So I think I've had the privilege of watching the emergence of these tick populations very, very rapidly, and that's not been a good thing for, for human health. Um, so anytime you disrupt an, the equilibrium out there, things, unexpected things might happen. So. And with that change, one of the most important things is to build resilience or the capacity for a system to transition well through that change or um, be able to withstand the effects of climate change better than if um, nothing was done. So um, really the work that we're focusing on is building resilience of these systems so that they're better able to cope with the effects of climate change. And we talked about the species that we could see changing. Could we see human refugees heading for the Adirondacks to get away from the coastline and some of the coastal cities and other areas that are impacted by climate change? Mm -hmm. We see some of that now and we definitely expect on a global scale to see large population movements within many of our lifetimes. We want to mention, we did invite the state of New York, both NYSERDA and DEC, to join us, but they both declined. So, Willie, we turn to you as the conservation group that keeps an eye on the Adirondacks and, and watches over the state. How has the state responded to climate change? What sort of action plans are in place or being proposed to get us to use more renewable energy and to cut the size of our carbon footprint? Well, you're picking on me, too, because, as you know, Tom, I'm also a former official with you the are. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, where I served for six years. And when you talk to the people inside the state, I mean, 15 years ago, the New York State DEC did not have a climate office. We do now. It did not have an invasive species office. We do now. And we have really dedicated professionals working with nowhere near the resources they need, but well aware of the challenges they face. And there's a lot of reason for our audience to get pessimistic listening to the ticks, the invasive species, the science is irrefutable. But there's also reason for optimism. And when you talk to the people working in the state, they think about how before 1990, our lakes had been killed off by acid rain. The loons were gone, the ravens were gone. If you saw a bald eagle, it was probably stuffed in a museum. And 30 years later, we have turned that around. We have trout back, we have loons back. And it's because of actions taken at the state level, at the federal level, beyond. And so while there's a huge um, sense of intimidation by the size of this challenge, there's also a sense of we've done this before. This is bigger. And so there are folks working hard at the state level to try and replicate at a much larger scale the success we've had on acid rain on a global level and not wait for a Trump administration in Washington that seems to be going in the wrong direction not wait on national consensus, but to move here in New York. So that the state, I think, fully embraces the challenge they have and are aspiring to lead. You just mentioned it. Could some of those gains be jeopardized now? Yes. One of the challenges because of acid rain is even though you see a lot of recovery, it's like a cancer patient that has recovered. The underlying buffering capacity of our soils in the Adirondacks is not what it was before acid rain. So just a small increase in some other stresses could have much larger that scaled up impacts negative for the environment, which impacts the tourism, impacts the quality of life, impacts health, the other issues that we're having. So yeah, there's a whole potential cascading negative effect there. But the good news is that people have identified that and realized that. And you have work that the Nature Conservancy has been doing, that Brendan has worked, looking at one part of the solution is to protect our natural systems. You have Paul Smith, you have the SUNY system, you have a lot of institutions that the state, thankfully, is able to lean on because they don't have all the resources they need themselves. The state's goals for renewable energy, 2030, 2050, realistic? That we can get to 70% by 2030, 100% by 2050? I think those are doable and we've gotta have bold goals. One of the challenges right now in Albany this, um, at this time that, that we're taking, taping this program is that there are competing proposals and there's a challenge to be more ambitious, but what is really needed is a, a new deal that is realistic and ambitious. And so we are hopeful, and again, a lot of organizations are working together with the state to try and marry the best of legislative and executive proposals um, before the end of June so that 
um, the state has a new law that actually codifies in law the goals that are being set. Right now, the state's goals are, without ex with only a few exceptions, are basically not codified in law, and that's a weakness. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is one of the few Republicans on Capitol Hill who says climate change is real DHS and could very and soon, in parts of the, the world, Canadian become a serious threat to our national security. Properly. During a trip to the North Country last week, the Congresswoman sat down with us to talk about the need to address climate change. It is urgent and it's a generational issue. I'm one of the younger members of Congress, no longer the youngest, uh, but this is something that my generation is going to inherit. I've been a leader when it comes to not only the acknowledgement of climate change, but also the focus on science-based solutions. Um, I've been a leader when it comes to promoting renewable energy, uh, both nationally but specifically in the district. Uh, I've supported solar and wind tax credits. I've also, I also believe that we should have more of a level playing field with other renewable energy resources when it comes to tax incentives. Opportunities like biomass or hydro, uh, those are clean energy sources that we need to be incentivizing their utilization. Is an incentive program like that enough, do you think? It's a key part of the solution, and it would be a big step forward. More than that is ultimately needed, but we need to take every step we can. And the Congresswoman, as a Republican leader in the House, has an opportunity to help advance and make sure some of those proposals actually get turned into law that actually happen and go the right way. Ultimately, the, the way to evaluate any elected official is not by what they're saying and what they're promising, but what they're delivering. And Congresswoman Stefanik, as many people around Lake Champlain know, teamed up last year with uh, Congressman Welsh from Vermont and secured an additional $4 million for a total of $8.4 million in funding for Lake Champlain. If we can do something like that at a larger scale, then she will have delivered what her district and her people need. We welcome our audience now to join in. I have a two-part question, part for Willie and part for you, Leanne. Um, do we have enough baseline data to measure change in terms of vegetation in the Adirondacks, in terms of tree species? Uh, have we done a bio blitz, for instance, on, on a section that we can go back to and, and measure repeatedly over the, the near future and, and di distant future to look for change in terms of speciation, tree speciation? That's part of the question. And the other part would be insects. Um, there was a study j done in Germany uh, a year or two ago that was published, and they used an entomology group that um, was collecting masses of insects in some kind of a trap. And someone went back and looked at that data and found that there was an 83% drop mm -hmm. in the mass of insects in this one locale. Mm -hmm. Do we have data on, or are we collecting data on insect mass? I think what you're um, a proponent of is long-term monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as a scientist, I'm very frustrated uh, at lack of funding for, for monitoring work. Uh, it's not considered science, and it's often not fundable by agencies like the National Science Foundation. The work I do, I think, is so, is so critical to protect people directly. Our, our work goes right into the clinic, right. but we can't get funding to do it. Right. And so I, I would put out a call for a little bit more awareness of need for long-term monitoring. And I would say, when I was working for New York State DEC, it seemed like we didn't have the resources we needed to, to be able to do the kind of monitoring to help us make sure we were making good decisions. And now, as an advocate, it's more clear than ever. The success over the last 30 years with acid rain has actually, unfortunately, led to a huge cut in the dollars available for the type of long-term monitoring. So we're struggling with how to use the acid rain monitoring to try and look at climate change. And what we really need to be doing is investing more than we are currently investing in long-term monitoring of the things that 10 and 20 years from now we wish we had yeah. been measuring this yeah. summer. Mm -hmm. And so while there is some really good monitoring going on and there are some great people and nonprofits doing pieces of that, it's underfunded, there's not the kind of comprehensive system there should be. So one of the most comprehensive data sets nationally, nationally is conducted by the U.S. Forest Service and is the Forest Inventory and Assessment pro Program. So that data set has been in existence for several decades. Um, again, it's not nearly as robust as it should be. Um, but there are plots stationed throughout the Adirondacks that have been evaluating that change over time. The only issue is you have to evaluate at the county scale because of the coarseness of the data. Right. Um, there are only you know, one or two plots per county in most cases. Well, one of the ironies of that data set, if I may, is even as limited as it is, 
one of the things we can do to fight climate change is sequester more carbon. And the Adirondacks should be really good at that. We have a lot of trees. We have a lot of forests. But it looks as if the rate of sequestration going on in the Adirondacks is well below the rate happening statewide, which means we need to update our incentives for growing trees and better manage the forests that we do have to bring up that level of sequestration to help not only the Adirondacks, but help the state meet its, goal, meet its goals of carbon neutrality. But that will be guided by more science yeah. uh, than we have now. Are you looking for volunteers? Like this entomology group was a volunteer mm -hmm. group that was collecting bugs for mm -hmm. 30 years. Citizen science programming is going to be even more critical yeah. in the years ahead. Yeah. So we're hoping to expand a lot of our volunteer monitoring programs for lakes and terrestrial systems in the Adirondacks. Um, and I know other organizations are doing the same. Yeah. And Mountain yep. Bird Watch, we saw a little yep. earlier in the program, uh, their volunteers, 130 sites across New York and throughout New England, again, using the citizen scientists to gather the data when it comes to the migratory songbirds to see what impact mm -hmm. it's having on them. So my name's Cody Berry. I'm from Saranac Lake, New York. One of the panel members mentioned uh, rearing a beetle mm -hmm. in order to kind of battle the hemlock woolly adelgic and uh, i mean are we looking at a situation where uh, sure that beetle might come and help combat it but then we have a lot of a beetle in the area i mean this has been tried in i mean one of the ones that comes in, to mind is australia where they had uh, i think it was a toad problem mm -hmm. and they had to introduce mm -hmm. a snake to kill the toad <laughs> but then they're left with a ton of snakes in australia which they already had enough of yeah, you're absolutely right. So we've kind of learned from our past mistakes where we've introduced species kind of unknowingly um, and seen the consequences of what that does. So the, the classical biocontrol process is much more comprehensive now. So the, the concept essentially is to go back to the native range of where the, the pest you're looking to control was located, trying to find a native pest or pathogen there that only feeds on that that in, or that um, invasive species that you're looking to control. And then bringing it here, doing a ton of research, usually decades worth of research, to make sure that it does only feed on the invasive that you're looking to control. Once it goes through that process, it goes through a federal review. Um, so um, even though we have had you know, blunders in the past, the process now is very quality controlled. And I'll speak to some examples. So one of the most um, you know, recent examples is the control of purple loosestrife. Purple loosestrife used to be abundant throughout New York State and now is being actively controlled by the Galarcella beetle. And so the reductions in purple loosestrife that you are seeing are not a result of active management that are happening, but this beetle feeding on it and only feeding on purple loosestrife. So we're hopeful that we can replicate, replicate that success. And do you have an ideal beetle that we'd be using for the hemlock woolly? Yeah, so Laracobius nigrinus is the, the one that's being researched most extensively right now at Cornell University. Jen Kretzer is the Director of Climate Initiatives for the Wild Center in Tupper Lake. Nice to have you here tonight. Thank you Welcome. very much for having me. Tell us about the climate initiatives that you folks are working on at the Wild so Center. So the work that we do is um, primarily focused on young people, uh, high school students. So can we, what we do is we convene, engage, and inspire young people to learn about the climate science, the local impacts, many of which we're hearing about tonight, and then to focus on solutions in, um, in their schools and communities. The Youth Climate Summit. That's yes. been going almost ten years now. Was Actually, we're in our eleventh. Are year. you really? So we've been. Um, so we've done now uh, 10 summits. We're in our 11th year. We've actually helped to inspire around 70 youth climate summits globally. So the program has really taken off. And so we work with, um, in the North Country, work with about 30 to 40 different school districts um, that all now have green teams established, that have high school, hi high school teachers working with their students to help support projects that the students come up with. So they're student driven, they're solutions focused, there's, um, it's very hopeful. <laughs> Uh, and they're working on problems that directly address issues that um, they are of critical concern to them in their school and their communities. For us, for people here tonight in the audience, what can we do? What, what are some of the individual things we can do? There are lots of things that we can do. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's certainly, it's really important to take action at home, certainly as individuals, but we really are trying to focus on now. I mean, and those actions can be all sorts of things, like looking at your energy efficiency, looking at um, 
your waste stream, like where does your waste go, how much waste are you using, uh, food waste um, is a big one. So thinking about how can you compost or how can you get your food into a composting program. Um, so there's lots of individual actions that we can take, but we really need to move from me to we and really start thinking collectively about solutions at um, a community, county, region, state, scale. So those are the things we're thinking about now. And actually some of our um, students are working in partnership with uh, New York State's uh, Office of Climate Change to help communities to become climate smart communities. And that actually happened um, in April here in Plattsburgh. Some of the students from Plattsburgh's green team is amazing green team. Um, teachers here in the audience, <laughs> shout out to her. Um, but they, you know, they approached the city council and, um, and asked the city to become a climate smart, to take the climate smart community pledge. And what that will do, once a community in any community in New York can do this, there's over 250 communities already registered. Once they pledge to do that, it opens them up to free technical support. It opens them up to um, funding opportunities through the state to be more um, resilient, to help uh, look at mitigation and adaptation and then they can start going through a certification process. So we actually have communities um, in the Adirondacks that have students can on their task forces and helping communities and being at the table where communities are making decisions and thinking about solutions and how we can build um, a greener, safe, and more sustainable place. And if folks would like to see a good example of how students can make a difference, there's a documentary produced a few years ago called The Resilient Ones, A Generation Takes on Climate Change. It'll be on our website. It's also online. Folks can go and watch mm -hmm. that. That's a great story of how students came together and really are making a difference. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. And our thanks to our audience, our panel, and those of you watching at home. You'll find all of our recent stories and a recent talk from renowned climate change author Bill McKibben on our website, along with tonight's full forum. For all of us at Mountain Lake PBS, I'm Tom Halleck. Thanks for watching.